Welcome to Arts Express. This is Prairie Miller and on the show. First, we'll hear a little Amiri Baraka. Fashion this from the Irony of the World. The late iconic poet and activist performing live at the Sanctuary for Independent Media back then. Fashion this from the Irony of the World. That I... The undaunted laureate of the place, daunted in some unagiated pretense of what they see, they be as if such where they was, was yet to be, and then to say they is and is not, like revelations, wow, humans. The skin, the lodging inside dumbness, a slight breeze frees they speech, to speak as if acquainted with small things in the world, eating, murder, robbery. And so, as if, and them too they is, but nothing further but the wee dots on the deletion resembling the minds of them yet to come. Imagine you were me, or imagine you were thee, and we knew all the things both do and is, and will ourselves to be. Imagine you were in this place and they wanted to run everywhere pointless, endless, understanding not even why they smell or their hair fall out or what to do about gout, that they are yet stupid to colds and cancer and death, they think holy. When death is simply a report card of the ignorant, nothing dies but that which never lived. And they might return in a white suit and in charge of ugly small mistakes. Somebody at Harvard could win a billion dollars in a post if they could find out, but they never will because it's the reason they committed suicide. Suppose you had to live with ignorant white people and Negroes in cages with important chains around their mouth. Suppose you had heard of Trent Lott. Suppose you woke up 1 a.m. and there was a vampire on the tube being interviewed by a niggolino boob, a handsome rat for whom the idea of brain was only an idea, which he did not think if he could was a bad one. And the boob was a killer, yet to graduate from killer school. So he worshiped the vampire's teeth. The two juicy fangs hanging from each end of his lip, the Negro thought was hip. And dreamed of having teeth like that so he could be a rat. He was tired of being a mere heel. And the vampire was planning to bite the whole world, to suck the blood out of everything, to suck the blood out of the world and make its future a vampire. That could whirl through space and suck the blood out of the stars, suck the blood out of the planets, suck the blood out of the moon, suck the blood out of the sun, and then armed and blubbery fat with everything's blood still hot and musical like emptiness, he could lift into the outer way gonosphere and search for God if there was such and suck the blood out of him, her, it, them, whatever, till there was no blood anywhere, not even you, blood. In fact, you'd be the one the first to go. It was a special issue of Jungle Comics where the vampire, the thin-nosed kind from the outback who can suck with his teeth and stir with his nose, whose eyes are missing, and what you see is the bottom of coal mine filled with 2,000 pounds of lynch. Execution, missing, rape, cheated, framed, slandered, stolen, frowned, frozen ex corpuscles. Lonnie's Lament. He is called Fangul the Asshole and dances to dry lips set on fire by missing junkies he has eaten. He is the devil's newspaper and wears his ass backwards so the colon can wear a uniform. 
And revelations can be burned, especially chapter 18, verse 12, where it say, Beware of ugly, who is not really ugly, but uglier, much, 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 much more uglier than that. So spake not, amen. I speak with the rage of angels, them that be with marks. I speak with the clarity and inferno of the necessary. Like my man John on Patmos watching Sky Vision and digging it was all commercials. I blow with the deep fear of John on the island looking at the actual devil. I am like him in that I try to count the Mammy Jammer's heads and horns and find out what will kill him. I speak like him who spoke to Philadelphia and hung out with Jesus before they murdered him. I speak like him who dug that Peter was a coward and gave the Lord up and that Paul was an anti-Semite who never came out of the closet. I speak as one who knew Judas would drop a dime on the movement and confirmed the chump had hung his lousy self just before I got busted. I speak as one betrayed by the lies of those who say they are religious but are greed-ridden worshipers of Satan who kill anyone who opposes them and calls it a church of defense against evil. Like John, I would speak. Like John, who baptized. Like John, the knower. John, the blower. John, the brown. John, the revelator. I speak like James, the brother. James, the other. Jim, the hip. Like Dick, the rude. Like Bird, the high. Like Monk, the deep. I speak from the island of my soul and cast a terrified look into the sky filled with monsters, with witches and devils, with great whores and beasts of things with heads and horns and blood dripping out of their eyes. It's out. It's out. Imagine you were here in this place, staring into the soul of something filthy, trying to keep it from murdering you to keep your eyes from registering, your ears from hearing, your mouth from reporting, and you could feel it breathing on your neck and saw sometimes the shadow of its horny hands reaching out of the blind dark. You could see the shadow of its gun, its lie, its teeth sweating. Imagine you could actually understand its obscene ideas and they made you enter the mind of Fred Douglas and stare out at the ocean just as John at the edge of Africa staring at the overhead commercials on the death of the beast. And so the blessing that is in my name and in my words, I give to myself and you who are truthful as the actual life of the world. And it is this blessing which will save us, will make us strong as we go on with our work, our work of scientifically determining how to kill the beast. Each night I fill my notebooks with formula and instructions to myself and others what to do and what to study, where to go, who to talk to and when. I make lists of words and names and events and processes, necessary stages of what we have come to realize is protracted and what we do we will do and what we succeed at is worth the pain, what we fail at is worth the understanding if we can understand what the next step is. We are studying with all our minds and hearts and souls determination to understand how to slay the serpent. This task, Nat handed down to whoever did understand that that was what he did, hanging on that tree, slain by the serpent's host. So we have learned that we cannot die except by our own submission to it and decided we will not die except when we understand what place we go to and so begin to set that where in order and begin to understand where the beast will be hiding there. We are the rider of the black horse. Black horse, black rider. We are the rider of the black horse. Black horse, black rider. Who conquers with a scale, with justice and measure in the mighty pentatonic mode of the finite music of infinity, a new joint. And when I returned from this forwarding of my feeling and knowing, the beast sat still and his teeth wiggled with lies. And at once I remembered where before I'd seen him, before his tenure as the counterfeit ghost in the Caucasian crib. Yes, it was the same one. Remember the little devil that Gerald 2X arrested and placed in the pages of Muhammad Speaks? And we saw him where Malcolm had locked him up with the little horns out of his head and the evil eyes 
and the twin fang straws for sucking oil and blood. It got clear to me as he rose to leave, and the Negro boob slobbered happiness at being recognized as the newest commode in the Caucasian abode. The vampire turned, and where before the cunning little tail that used to dingle out his hiney struck me at its absence, oh, I thought. And at that moment I saw the thing dart like a copperhead's fart out of the Negro's curl lips, ring with the white chalk, Caucasian chuckle, Caucasian circle of merit, which identifies wooden Negroes, promoted to the honorary genus of homo locus subsidiary, literally near man or near the man who no longer kneel when they are made well-paid heels, but now can assume the funky bedbug crouch of the hideously self-hating. At the same time, they are given a great facsimile carte blanche weapon of ugliness to use against N-words and any who would violate the sanctity of northern appetite. And so I came to understand that the beast's deadly arrow shot from out of the first horseman's white bow from the white horse. The weapon which Revelations prophesied to John was the weapon of his transitory rule, was now the tongue of the boob, whom I err at calling him that, or rat, or heel, or dog, or traitor. That that tail become a tongue was the sign that from the vampire's tail was bestowed on the wooden negro a badge that allowed him to enter clan meetings and skinhead lynchings and Texas executions and Palestinian ethnic cleansing and report with the slobber of his terrification's white ring serpent's beak. Symbol, font, and punctuation on the tabula rasa of the media sheet, the empty echo of his eviscerated self. And in the soul's place, that beast tail was hung. And in the soul's place, that beast tail was hung. The beast tail was sung. And I stood, and I stood, and I stood remembering Patmos. And the images that sailed across the air when you and I was there. I stood remembering Patmos and the images that sailed across the air when you and I was there. And wondered what next the world of this life held for those who would love goodness. What next the world of this life held for those who would love goodness, for those who would love goodness. And thank you to the Media Sanctuary Channel for that with Rob Brown on saxophone. And now on Arts Express, the Hemingway PBS documentary is, well, complicated. Here to talk about his latest documentary, the six-hour PBS television series Hemingway, and take the Arts Express hot seat, is filmmaker Ken Burns. And with his characteristic style of what's been referred to as a hybrid mix of documentary and drama, nonfiction filmmaking. Now, despite its exhaustive length of six hours, is there much more than meets the eye amid controversial reactions as to who is the real Hemingway or not? And let's just say what's predominantly missing is Hemingway's left politics throughout his life, and later on, pursued by the FBI, in particular regarding his relations with the Spanish Civil War, the Cuban Revolution, and once referring to Socialist Party presidential candidate Eugene Debs back in 1920 as the only one worthy of the title of U.S. president. And though Hemingway's paranoia at the end of his life requiring hospitalizations stemmed from his multiple traumatic brain injuries and alcoholism, the fact that his claim of being followed around by the FBI, which Burns seems dismissive of, bears validity but receives no mention in the documentary, despite 100 FBI pages on file about Hemingway, 15 of them redacted, including monitoring his hospital psychiatrist's contact with him 
and FBI agent memos proposing how to destroy Hemingway's public reputation. Which is not surprising considering this is a production of PBS, which tends to clam up when it comes to pursuing left political issues. But there's really no excuse in this instance, which I often hear when asking our hot seat guests, so where's the politics? That, well, they'll say, a film presents only limited time to, quote, unquote, cover everything. But with Hemingway's six-hour running time, that would hardly be a defense. And we'll also be taking a look with Burns at an additional controversy that's just come up concerning his documentary. A protest letter sent to PBS from nearly 100 documentary filmmakers addressing the public TV station's lack of diversity and its airing of primarily white filmmakers, especially in its over-reliance on Burns. But first, a little of the Hemingway series prologue, quite eloquent when it comes to focusing on the writer's literary creativity, but otherwise not so much, or even tending towards tabloid sensationalism in scrutinizing his sexuality. The film is narrated by Peter Coyote, with Meryl Streep, Kerry Russell, Mary Louise Parker, and Patricia Clarkson as his four wives, and Jeff Daniels as Hemingway, reading from his work. Then we'll hear from Ken Burns. Hemingway was a writer who happened to be American. But his palate was incredibly wide and delicious and violent and brutal and ugly, all of those things. It's something every culture can basically understand. Every culture can understand falling in love with someone, the loss of that person of how great a meal tastes, how extraordinary this journey is, that is not nationalistic, it's human. And I think with all of his flaws, with all the difficulties, his personal life, whatever, he seemed to understand human beings. You see, I'm trying in all my stories to get the feeling of the actual life across not to just depict life or criticize it, but to actually make it alive so that when you have read something by me, you actually experience the thing. You can't do this without putting in the bad and the ugly as well as what is beautiful. Because if it is all beautiful, you can't believe in it. Things aren't that way. It is only by showing both sides, three dimensions and if possible four, that you can write the way I want to. Ernest Hemingway remade American literature. He paired storytelling to its essentials, changed the way characters speak, expanded the worlds a writer could legitimately explore, and left an indelible record of how men and women lived during his lifetime. Generations of writers would find their work measured against his. Some followed the path he'd blazed. Others rebelled against it. None could escape it. He made himself the most celebrated American writer since Mark Twain, read and revered around the world. It's hard to imagine a writer today who hasn't been in some way influenced by him. It's like he changed all the furniture in the room, right? And we all have to sit in it to some, you know, we can kind of sit on the edge of the armchair on the arm or do this, but you know, he, he, he changed the furniture in the room. The value of the American declarative sentence, right? The way you build a house brick by brick out of those 
within a few sentences of reading a Hemingway story, you were not in any confusion as to who had written it. I can't imagine how it's possible that any one writer could have so changed the language. People have been copying him for nearly 100 years, and they haven't succeeded in equaling what he did. If you're a writer, you can't escape Hemingway. He's so damn popular that you can't begin to write till you try and kill his ghost in you or embrace it. And I think I identify that most about Hemingway is that he was always questing. The perfect line had not happened yet. It was always a struggle trying to get it right, and you never will. For three decades, people who had not read a word he'd written thought they knew him. Wounded veteran and battlefield correspondent, big game hunter and deep sea fisherman, bullfight aficionado, brawler and lover and man about town. But behind the public figure was a troubled and conflicted man who belonged to a troubled and conflicted family with its own drama and darkness and closely held secrets. The world saw him as a man's man, but all his life he would privately be intrigued by the blurred lines between male and female, men and women. There were so many sides to him, the first of his four wives remembered that he defied geometry. He was open to life, he was open to tragedy, he was open to feeling. I liked that he fell in love, and he fell in love quite a few times. He always had the next woman before he left the existing woman. He was often kind and generous to those in need of help and sometimes just as cruel and vengeful to those who had helped him. I have always had the illusion it was more important or as important to be a good man as to be a great writer. I may turn out to be neither, but would like to be both. Hemingway's story is a tale older even than the written word of a young man whose ambition and imagination, energy and enormous gifts bring him wealth and fame beyond imagining, who destroys himself trying to remain true to the character he has invented. One of his weaknesses, I was going to say failings, and it was a great pity. It's a great pity for any writer. He loved an audience. He loved an audience, and in front of an audience, he lost the best part of himself by trying to impress the audience. I hate the myth of Hemingway, and the reason I hate the myth of Hemingway, it obscures the man, and the man is much more interesting than the myth. I think he was a terrific father sometimes, I think that he was a loving husband sometimes. I think he was like so many people, except this enormous talent. Hemingway is complicated. He's very complicated. The great thing is to last and get your work done and see and hear and learn and understand and write when there is something that you know and not before and not too damned much after. Welcome. Thank you, Prairie. Thank you for having me. Okay. 
Why did you decide on Hemingway as your current project and your Hemingway, and in particular as the man versus the myth? Well, you know, a current project doesn't exist for us. We decided to do this in, in 2012. We started shooting in 2014. We've got other projects that are always going on in various stages of completion that are symbiotically helpful in, in, in helping us do whatever project. And, of course, you want to do the real person. The mythology is what gets in the way with Hemingway. It's a mythology that he helped create as filled with tall tales and outright lies. The <laughs> outlines of it are true. He was a naturalist. He was a big game hunter. He was a deep-sea fisherman. He was a brawler. He was a man about town. But what happened is it's sort of like when he became king of the fiction racket, as his friend John Dos Passos said, he kind of built a castle. And around that castle, he built a moat of his mythology. Mm. And it kept people out, and it also kept him from getting I – mean, kept, kept people from – getting into him, but it also kept him from getting out into the world, and he suffered immensely for it. And so this is a way for us, using the extraordinary literature, he's arguably the most important American writer of the 20th century, his, he reinvented the short story and the novel and even nonfiction writing, and it influenced everybody else, even if they're choosing not to be like him. They are, of course, in relationship and in influence by Ernest Hemingway, and yet you know, he comes off as this kind of toxic masculine figure. Behind it is an empathy, and we learn from letters and from scholarship and all sorts of things, an empathy and a vulnerability and a sensitivity, lots of evidence of misogynist behavior, and yet a couple of his short stories and parts of his novels are so empathetic that the Irish novelist Edna O'Brien said it, it's like it could have been written by a woman. He was able to achieve this extraordinary androgyny that permitted him to get under the skin of the women characters and and in fact those women characters are suffering the indignities of people like Hemingway or at least people like the myth of Hemingway so it's always extraordinarily important to get beyond uh, the, the you know the conventional wisdom of it and we had to check that baggage long long ago and dive deep into a very complex and contradictory uh, human being. And in connection to the personal side of Hemingway, as opposed to the literary legend, his toxic masculinity, sexism, and racism, though politically he supported the Cuban Revolution as, quote, historical necessity, this topic has come up a lot lately with cancel culture of shunning and boycotting exceptional creative figures because of their personal behavior. What are your own thoughts about that as well? And not only about cancel culture personally, but extending to the political as well. And why don't we hear about Hemingway's left politics? How his hounding by the FBI may have contributed to his paranoia? And for instance, the banning in 1941 of his classic For Whom the Bell Tolls, denounced as pro-communist, and which was based on his own experiences in that socialist struggle against fascism in Spain. Why are these issues left out? Well, I don't, you know, we are, I don't know anyone who's perfect, and I don't know, I understand that there is a desire to have an absolute black and white kind of understanding of things, but that can't exist. We, we couldn't be friends with anybody. We couldn't even live with ourselves if we didn't tolerate contradiction in some ways. I mean, he wrote, he used the N-word in his writing, but he was often just writing how people wrote. Was it excessive? Yes. Did it betray a casual racism? Of course. Uh, Anti-Semitism in The Sun Also Rises is inexcusable, and we hold his feet to the fire. And yet, you know, he was, you know, the early part of the 30s, he sounded like a reactionary libertarian. Within a few years, he's fighting for a Soviet-supported cause, or he's reporting on a Soviet-supported cause in the Spanish Civil War. And it's, so it's, there, there's lots of that. I mean, his first wife said, there's so many sides to Ernest Hemingway, he defies geography. And so it becomes impossible to say he's one thing, because at any given moment, I can give you another, including, you know, this big macho guy is also curious about gender fluidity. We didn't even have a term for it when he was alive. Everybody was sort of shocked when it, it sort of bubbled up into fiction. And yet, today, we're not surprised. We're like, wow, this is extraordinary. Um, and he's 
curious about this in a really direct and frank way, and he writes about it with um, the same greatness that he wrote about, uh, say, World War One in A Farewell to Art. And I wanted to ask you, what is your reaction to the letter of protest sent by documentary filmmakers to PBS protesting the promotion of your work and other white filmmakers to the relative exclusion of directors of color? Well, that is a, uh, not a, an accurate characterization of what the letter said. I'm totally in support of their aims and objectives of more diversity. Um, it doesn't come as a result of mine. I raise a huge percentage of my budget outside of public television, and um, I, I just support them. I, I do think that we can all do better. I can certainly do better, uh, and PBS can do better, and, and I, I just think it was a really great letter that, you know, reminded us of the kind of moment we're in. And what can you say about the next film you're working on, Muhammad Ali? How would you say this will be a new and different portrait of Ali in comparison to what's come before about him? Well, you know, this is a topic um, that there are lots of uh, ancestors. Um, there are lots of other documentaries. This is our, I, I think, very unique film on World War II. had probably a thousand other brethren uh about it uh, this is the whole story to, to not, you know it's it's the it's the boyhood in louisville in jim crow louisville through death by parkinson's and often other documentaries that picked one fight or a couple of years his battle with the united states over induction into the armed forces um this is a comprehensive four-part eight hour thing we've been working on it for years and years and years and have uncovered unbelievably never-before-seen footage and photographs and have a compelling sense of people, including family members, uh, remembering him. And uh, we're very excited to share it. It's coming out on PBS and starting on September 19th. And what do you think Hemingway would be up to if he were around today? Well, he, he wouldn't be up to much because he'd be uh, 121. <laughs> Uh, about to turn 122 this July. Uh, but I do think that begs a much more important question. People often ask me, what do I want out of this? And I guess I go, okay, I hope you read. Maybe go back to Hemingway. Maybe read him for the first time. Maybe go to other writers to read, read. But I'd also say with this story, don't be an alcoholic and get help if you need men if you have mental health issues. And Hemingway did, and he lived at a time when it was so stigmatized that he couldn't even talk about it with his wife, let alone a, a larger circle of family and friends, let alone the public. And and we've learned in the intervening decades to somewhat destigmatize this. And and I I'm not sure that anything could have separated us from the tragic ending. Given the number of demons, the history of mental illness in the family, the nine major concussions he had that could have caused the kind of dementia that he had, the PTSD, the alcoholism, the self-medication, all of this created a kind of mania and, and uh, madness uh, in him that it may be impossible. But we could have at least, um, if, we, if he'd been around now with these things, we might have been able to save him. And I, I would just say to people... Don't drink too much, and if you are having suicidal ideations or suffering from some form of mental illness, there are ways to be helped. And that's, you know, other than telling you a just rip-snortingly complicated story about uh, one of the great writers of all time, um, those, that's the takeaway for me. Okay, thank you for calling in. Thank you. Hi, yeah. And that was Ken Burns talking about his Hemingway currently airing on PBS stations. And more about that lack of diversity protest letter to PBS from one of the signers of that letter, filmmaker Grace Lee, who stated that PBS must end its over-reliance on Ken Burns as, quote, America's storyteller. Across the morning sky All the birds are leaving Ah, how can they know 
It's time for them to go Before the winter fire We'll still be dreaming I do not count the time Hi, this is Judy Collins on Arts Express, and today I'm telling you, first of all, have a great day, and be sure to remember Arts Express. This is Judy Collins, so cheers. Sad, deserted shore, your fickle friends are leaving. Ah, but then you And now on Arts Express. Hi, this is Jack Shalom. I first heard poet Paul Hostofsky reading in a poetry series out of Boston called Razi Reads. His poems immediately struck me as funny, closely observed, crafted stories, the kind you come home and tell your intimate other about. In a writing career that now spans 11 full-length collections of poetry, he writes about growing up, marriages, divorces, lovers, friends, children, and work. His latest collection is called Death and Blind. Paul's work for the past decades situates him in a unique position with regard to language. Hostovsky is a sign language interpreter and a Braille instructor who has been a recipient of an award from the American Association of the Deaf Blind, quote, for being a devoted friend and ambassador by promoting the interests and well-being of deafblind Americans, unquote. Well, as I went through Paul's collections of poetry, there were just so many that I wanted to bring to you, but I hope you enjoyed this selection that I'm reading today. And now the poems. Coconut. Bear with me. I want to tell you something about happiness. It's hard to get at, but the thing is I wasn't looking I was looking somewhere else when my son found it in the fruit section and came running, holding it out in his small hands, asking me what it was and could we keep it? It only cost 99 cents. Hairy and brown, hard as a rock, and something swishing around inside. And what on earth? And where on earth? And... This was happiness, this little ball of interest beating inside his chest, this interestedness beaming out from his face, pleading, happiness. And because I wasn't happy, I said to put it back because I didn't want it, because we didn't need it. And because he was happy, he started to cry right there in aisle five. So when we got it home, we put it in the middle of the kitchen table 
and sat on either side of it and began to consider how to get inside of it. Everyone was beautiful. The day that everyone was beautiful was like any other day. The only difference was that everyone was beautiful, and the day itself was a beautiful summer day or spring day or one of those late winter days that smells like spring. And if it was fall, it was early fall when it's all but technically summer and everyone was simply beautiful, not sexy beautiful, or movie star beautiful, or drop-dead gorgeous beautiful, but everyone, but everyone had this patina of slightly bruised longing, this shimmer of, I think I knew you when we were children, this look of I've loved you ever since you were born and probably longer than that. And it all started with the paper boy careening out of the blue dawn on his bicycle, pitching to the left and right with his ballast of 50 today's papers in a vast canvas sack slung over his shoulder, balancing himself and the whole world on the tip of morning, the streets beginning to stir with shadows and workers and cars, all of which were perfectly beautiful. And it continued on like that throughout the day with the gas station attendant and toll collectors and motorists and pedestrians and clerks, even the boss, even the boss's boss, who always seemed an ugly sort of fellow, really, especially on the inside. But on that day, even the ugliness was beautiful. It was a beautiful ugliness. The day that everyone was beautiful, and the day itself was a beautiful summer day. Man Running for Bus in Harvard Square This is a poem about seeing it both ways, about an idealist running for a bus and a realist driving that bus and seeing a hopeful expectant runner waving high and meaningfully with his briefcase flopping against his thigh and his excellent tie flapping in his face as he sprints toward the slowly departing bus. The bus which is departing, which is to say moving away from the curb. So you see, it isn't stopped. If it were stopped, it would be another poem altogether. But this poem is about a man who believes in communication and is running and waving a hand at a moving bus and another man who believes this man has missed this bus and is driving this bus and sees this man trying to stop a bus with a wave of his hand and a briefcase full of papers, briefs or notes for a class at Harvard, perhaps, and he chooses not to stop the bus, but rather to drive right past this idealist from Harvard who has missed the bus and thinks he can reverse it or revise this with his hand as though it were words, as though it weren't what actually happens. But he can't. No, not this. Rollover Bell When I see deaf people signing into their smartphones, singing into their smartphones. I can't help thinking of Alexander Graham Bell, enemy of sign language, oralist, teacher of the deaf, and inventor of the telephone, the single greatest handicap to deaf people's pursuit of jobs and happiness for 150 years. I imagine him rolling over with Beethoven, whose own deafness was variously attributed to syphilis, lead poisoning, typhus, his habit of immersing his head in cold water to stay awake while composing, 
roll over Beethoven and tell Tchaikovsky the news. The deaf are singing into their cell phones, signing into their cell phones. Signing is the most beautiful singing the world has ever seen, I whisper to Bell, who doesn't see it, though he can't stop staring. He grabs a fistful of his own beard as if to pinch himself awake from this impossible dream he never dreamt because of a failure of imagination. Watson, come here, I want you to see this, the dream that any deaf Tom, Dick, or Harry, or John, Paul, George, or Ringo, or Ludwig with two thumbs could punch in a number? and see the most beautiful singing the world has ever seen, and understand what it means, that dream is coming true. Mediocrity weeps to behold greatness. My new dentist is admiring the great works of my old dentist in my mouth. And it makes me feel like a museum of fine arts of sorts, with twenty years of gilded masterpieces filling my walls. He has never seen such beautiful margins. He says more to himself than to me, incredulous and impressed, and more than a little jealous, as he examines each one with our mouths open, tapping with his tiny round mirror as if to wake us from this dream of impossible beauty and perfection. Thank you doesn't seem the right thing to say somehow, and yet I say it anyway, with so many amazed fingers camped out on my tongue that it comes out sounding like hanky. That's when he abruptly turns off the light and wheels his stool away, somewhere behind me where I can't see him, wiping the tears from his eyes. Practice You can't even let go of the blue casserole dish. How in the world are you going to let go of the world, I ask myself standing in my kitchen in the late afternoon sunlight which is turning everything to gold everything that is except the blue casserole dish which isn't here because my stepdaughter borrowed it without asking me and it me off because i love that casserole dish because it belonged to my mother let it go, I tell myself, or maybe that's my mother telling me because she had so little time herself to practice letting go. Suddenly, finding herself on the gurney in emergency, apologizing to all the nurses. I'm sorry, I'm not very good at this. As if this were something one could get good at if one practiced letting go a little at a time, practiced dying a little at a time, practiced turning to gold a little at a time. Reprise. I like to do things twice. Reread the book I liked. Watch the movie again. Eat what I had for dinner last night, tonight. Have another drink. Kiss her one more time. Remarry. Get another divorce. Make the same mistakes. Learn twice as much from them. Anvil. One of those things that falls out of the sky onto people's heads in the cartoons. That's what that word makes me think of, not blacksmiths or metal workers or the shapes of thunderheads before a storm, but wily coyote Saturday mornings, my own fugitive childhood. Funny how we never see it coming out of left field, out of the blue, 
the bullet, the axe, the cancer, the falling pianos. Nobody thinks things fall out of the sky onto people's heads in real life until they do. Until they do. And you've been listening to a selection of poems written by Paul Hestovsky. That's H-O-S-T-O-V-S-K-Y, Hestovsky. And they were performed by myself, Jack Shalom. You can find more about Paul and order his books at his website, paulhestovsky.com. This is Jack Shalom for Arts Express with host Prairie Miller. That's all we have time for today on Arts Express, Expression in the Arts. And if you'd like to express yourself too, you can write to us at theradiogoddess at gmail.com. Until next time, this is Prairie Miller leaving the station.